I've been using my Raspberry Pi in this case that I 3D printed almost two years ago. It's been a great way to protect and cool my power, and I've even made up a few other variants for UPS and SSD shields. I printed this case on my original Ender 3 Pro, so when Pergear reached out and said that they'd like me to try out the new Ender 3 S1 Pro, I thought this would be a great opportunity to give my case a refresh. The Creality Ender series has been my go-to 3D printer for the past three years. I started with an Ender 3 Pro, and then got an Ender 3 V2, and then added a second Ender 3 V2. These three printers run for about 10 hours a day, and have been doing so for two years now without giving me any significant problems. I've kept them stock for the most part, and have found that a well set up Ender 3 prints as capably as other printers that are 3-5 to five times more expensive. They also have a large online community, a range of upgrades, and easily accessible spare parts. So I'm excited to see how the Ender S1 Pro stacks up, as it's got a number of upgrades and improvements over the original. Let's start out by getting the case designed so that we've got something to print. I'm going to use Fusion 360 this time around for a more refined finish. The previous case had a solid body with two clear sides, so I want to mix that up now by having a wraparound clear panel from the one side to the front. A small 45 degree section adds a bit of character to it, and will make the acrylic bends a bit more gradual, rather than a sharp 90 degree. I've also put the USB and Ethernet ports on the back, and I've left some headroom to add an ice cube cooler and fan. On the other side we've got the power, HDMI and audio ports, and I've added some vents above them for the exhaust air. Let's export the parts and get them 3D printed on the Ender 3 S1 Pro. But first we need to get it unboxed and assembled. Like with all my Enders, the S1 Pro comes really well protected with foam inserts, although this one is a lot more pre-assembled than the originals. The whole gantry is ready to be mounted onto the base, and then you just need to mount the extruder, add the display and add the filament holder. The base is quite a bit bigger than the original Ender 3 and Ender 3 V2, so keep that in mind if you've got limited desk space. Assembly took around 15 minutes, and is really simple with the included step-by-step -step instructions and tools. The general shape and layout is similar to the original Ender 3 series, but they've made a couple of quite significant upgrades with the S1 Pro. The extruder is now a direct drive, full metal, dual gear design, with a hot end that can reach up to 300 degrees Celsius. This opens up the possibility to print with a wide range of filaments, including flexible and high strength materials. They've also added a filament runout sensor that'll automatically pause the print if your filament runs out mid-print. The display has been upgraded to a full color touch display, allowing them to do away with the rotary push button on the older models. They've also done away with the vertical axis limit switch and have added their own CR Touch automatic bed leveling sensor to compensate for any print bed height differences. They also include a limit switch and cable as an option to add on if you don't want to use the CR Touch sensor. A new overhead LED light bar is a great addition for overnight prints and for keeping an eye on your prints remotely using a camera in a dark environment. The print bed is now equipped with a spring steel magnetic build plate and it's got dual Z-axis motors on the back something that was quite a common first upgrade on the original Ender. Those are the main upgrades from the originals, but it's also got a couple of now standard features like silent stepper motor drivers, a 32-bit control board, and adjustable belt tensioners. The printer currently retails for $499 on Pergear's Amazon store, or $480 on their web store. This is quite a bit more than the original Ender 3 series, but you're also getting a number of upgrades and features that are typically only available on higher end printers. Once assembled, I used the automatic bed leveling, set the nozzle offset, and then set the printer to work on a rabbit test print with the included filament. The results were really impressive. Keep in mind that this print is straight out of the box without any adjustments or tinkering with the printer. I didn't even touch the bed leveling adjustment knobs. I just let the automatic bed leveling take care of it. For my case print, I'm going to use black PLA for the print and I'll use 100% infill as the walls are already quite thin. 
I'm going to print the two parts separately rather than print them at the same time. This is so that there aren't any imperfections or seams caused when moving between the two parts. While the 3D printer is being finished off, let's get the clear acrylic panel laser cut. I'm cutting this panel from 2mm clear acrylic, and I'll then use this bending tool to heat up the two edges where we need to make the 45 degree bends. I've added a cutout for the fan and some guards for the two bend lines. We now have the parts complete and can start putting the case together. These prints came out really well for one of the first prints I've done on this printer. I'm impressed by the quality of the prints and how smooth the layer lines are. They really look quite professional. Let's start off by cleaning up the 3D printed parts by removing the print supports. Next let's bend the acrylic panel to fit the case. You'll see the small laser cut notches along the edges that I can use as guides for my bend lines, so I just need to put the bending tool between these two points and allow it to soften the acrylic. Once it's been heated, I can bend it into place following the profile of the case, which I'll do on this front edge. Now let's do the second bend in the same way. This one I'll need to do in place as I can't follow the front edge again or it'll be too big. I've designed guides along the edges to hold the acrylic, so I'll use those guides to get the final shape right. I think that's come out quite nicely and it looks like the acrylic follows the profile of the case quite well. For cooling I'm going to use this ice cube cooler by Sunfounder. This cooler is an improvement over the ice tile used previously, as the base has been designed to cover the CPU, RAM, Ethernet and USB controller chips, rather than just the CPU. So this should provide better cooling to the whole board. As with my previous design, I'm going to remove the fan from the ice cube and move it onto the acrylic side panel rather, so that it draws cool air in from outside the case. I'm going to be installing my 8GB Raspberry Pi 4B, and I'll be running Raspberry Pi OS Bullseye from a 32GB SanDisk Extreme microSD card. As you can see, the Ice Cube cooler covers the additional chips on the Pi and not just the CPU. Now let's install the Pi into the case. We'll do this by first securing the brass standoffs into the base of the case. These are held in place with an M2.5 nut on the bottom. Next we can position our Raspberry Pi on the standoffs and then add a second standoff onto each to hold it in place. Lastly we'll install the ice cube cooler on top of the Pi. Remember to add the cooling pads to the heatsink before you install it. Now we just use the included M2.5 screws to hold the cooler in place. With the acrylic side panel shape formed, let's mount our fan onto it using some black M3x8mm button head screws and nuts. As I've done previously, I'm going to push the nuts into the pockets in the fan to screw into. I've also got this carbon fibre fan grill which I found online. You can skip this if you want to see the RGB fan more clearly.
We can then peel off the rest of the protective film and install the clear side panel. The fan is plugged into the 5 volts and ground GPIO pins. You can also use the 3.3 volt pins if you'd like to run the fan a bit quieter, but it'll obviously lose some performance as well. The lid of the case is held in place with some more M3 by 8mm screws. And that's it, our case is now complete. So let's boot it up and run a test to see how the Ice Cube cooler handles full load. The stress test I'm going to use is called CPU burn. It's one that I've used previously for a couple of thermal tests as it seems to generate the most heat out of the tests I've tried. So running a full load on all four cores pushed the temperature up quite quickly from 23 to 26 degrees, and it seems to have stabilised there, which is not much of an increase at all. Without a cooler, the power thermal throttles in a few seconds with this test, so these large coolers work really well. Let's try overclock our power to 2 GHz and see how that does. After a quick reboot, let's try the test again. So at 2 GHz it still stabilizes at around 35 degrees, so there's probably some room to overclock it a bit further if you'd like to try that. But for now I'm really happy with the results and how this case has turned out. Overall I'm impressed with the print quality from the Ender 3 S1 Pro, and I'm looking forward to trying it out on some more challenging materials. I'd like to try print this case in a matte carbon fiber filament to see how that turns out. I also like that Creality have paid attention to some of the community's requests with this design, particularly in addressing common issues that have been reported on older models, like that dual Z-axis, and even with relatively minor issues like making the filament roller an actual roller. Check out Pergear's Amazon store or their web store to get your own Ender 3 S1 Pro. I'll leave links to their stores in the video description. Let me know what you think of the Ender 3 S1 Pro in the comment section below, and let me know what you think of my new case design. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more tech and electronics projects, tutorials, and reviews.